In Ghana, as the case in many African countries, business led by banks, telecommunication firms, and fintechs have been instrumental in driving the deployment of digital technology by developing unique solutions that work with the limitations of the existing ecosystems. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to point out that a comparative study on digitization and, in its, and its impact on economic development between sub-Saharan African countries and OECD countries, such as Austria, Belgium, and Norway, brought some interesting findings to the fore. While the effect of broadband internet is minimal for sub-Saharan Africa as compared to OECD countries, the impact of mobile telecommunications is higher in sub-Saharan Africa compared to OECD counterparts. This phenomenon is largely due to the ability of developing countries maximizing the usage of mobile technology and other less developed technologies to develop innovative, context-specific solutions. It is no surprise, therefore, that Africa and Ghana is classified as a world leader in mobile banking, money transfer, and small transactions using mobile technologies. Ghana's private sector has played an integral role in this regard, and it is time to deepen game-changing partnerships, particularly between private sector and the government, to speed up the digitalization agenda. As the leading bank in Ghana, GCB has been at the forefront of financial inclusion agenda since its inception, diligently meeting the financial needs of the people of Ghana with a great success. I am proud to announce on the 10th of April this year, G-Money, Ghana's first bank-led mobile money service, registered a million plus customers with a year, within a year of its operation. Let me use this occasion to express my appreciation to our customers for partnering with us in the country's quest for a cash-like society. This proves GCB's commitment to offer the public not only bank-based financial services, but also provide a more broad-based platform to serve other customers who may not have been able to transact through the banking system. This milestone, which took place in one year, shows how quickly and impactful the deployment of digital technologies can be. In championing our leadership role as a pioneer and largest national bank, we have initiated and broadened stakeholder engagement to leverage the G-Money platform as an industry-wide wallet for all banks. This creates favorable opportunity for competition by aggregating a huge customer base and data. On the back of a successful industry-wide partnership, we will be able to significantly improve the payment landscape and drive the financial inclusion agenda in a cost-effective manner. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, another important and often overlooked element in the digital stakeholder equation is the creation of digital citizens. Research reveals that the digital divide is more pronounced in sub-Saharan Africa due to significant differences in digital skills between different employment and education status groups, between rural and urban areas, and between younger and older persons. In Ghana, whilst many young people are already adept at utilizing digital and social media technologies, there seems to be a lack of awareness amongst the general population about the impact of digital technologies on economic development. Creating a digital, a digitally enabled citizenry 
will ensure that individuals in the country understand the bigger digitalization discussion and its impact on their lives. It also ensures that the citizenry in digitally literate, it also ensures that citizenry is digitally literate across our educational system and has the requisite skill to utilize digital technology to drive the adoption and use of digital products and services. Finally, it ensures that citizens have access to the requisite digitization infrastructure. It is therefore my hope to see more public-private partnerships extending the coverage of digital infrastructure. While pursuing these goals, ladies and gentlemen, we must take cognizance of the inherent risks associated with digital transformation, such as cybersecurity, fraud, data and privacy breaches. While the government of Ghana has put in place policies and structures through institutions like the Data Protection Commission to safeguard personal data, corporate organizations also have a responsibility. We need to continually invest in security infrastructure and also offer capacity building opportunities to keep all stakeholders abreast of these risks. The good news for Ghana remains the strong political will to drive through Ghana's digitalization expectations. Ghana's digitalization efforts have been gathering steam over the past few years because it is largely driven passionately by leadership. Likewise, we, as CEOs and business leaders, must create an enabling environment for digitalization to thrive. It is imperative that business leaders drive critical policy initiatives that will lead to Ghana's structural and economic transformation. While acknowledging the corporate gains, like the corporate giants, sorry, like GCB and other players represented here, have been at the forefront of helping the government, or the government to enforce the drive the needed and to enforce the drive and needed change. We still need to do more, nevertheless. We have to be digitalization champions in our various sectors. This CEO summit should be a springboard that reaffirms our commitment to Ghana's digital transformation agenda. Rather than implementing fragmented individual interventions, it is key for business leaders and technology innovators to come together to collaborate on the reinvention of products, processes, technologies, and culture through digital transformation. A key part of this collaboration should be exploring how to increase efficiency and agility with operational excellence while creating customer-obsessed experiences that grow revenue and reinvigorate businesses, including the acquisition of new customers. Your Excellency, distinguished and ladies and gentlemen, this will accelerate the development of a more comprehensive digitization ecosystem that allows us to harness the immeasurable opportunities it presents to our businesses, and more importantly, the communities we serve. As I close, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to commend the organizers of this event for creating a forum to move the digitalization agenda forward. I look forward to participating in subsequent sessions that will surely reset Ghana, our beloved mission. For prosperity through digital transformation beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Kofi Adumako, a faithful steward at the helm of Ghana's greatest asset, the GCB Bank. Thank you for all your work in promoting the bank as a center of excellence. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. And talking about excellence,
Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite up here a platinum sponsor who's been in the business of providing great A office spaces within the city. Ladies and gentlemen, Eris Property, the CEO, Mr. Enoch Entua Mensa. Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, fellow CEOs, I decided to change the phase of our presentation this morning by recommending one very able female to handle this morning's presentation. When Dr. K.K. Sapon was talking, he did indicate the fact that we need to make an effort to appoint a lot more female into the boardroom. I have elected one of my able assistants, Nana Abasegua Debi, to handle this presentation for this morning. Nana. Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, CEOs present, I'd like to thank Enoch for this opportunity given me. Um, basically, I'm here to talk about the whole new normal, return to work these strategies for Ghanaian corporate. So one would ask, why are we talking about technology and then we would introduce workplaces? So a study conducted by Deloitte says that about 30% of organizations would still stick to working remotely, but about 70, particularly in developing countries, would go back to work. And that's the essence of this presentation. So as corporates, as business organizations, we need to start re-strategizing re on how we would go back to work. Next slide. So basically, Eris Property is a property development firm it's backed by an institutional real estate fund called Momentum African Real Estate Fund. It's about 205 million USD private equity fund that looks at grade A offices and other commercial properties such as, work, um, such as warehouses, um, call it um, offices, and then retail. Um, Momentum's, Momentum's strategy is a very unique one because it blends Eris's, um, call it experience of over 25 um, years in property development with the Momentum Global Investment Management Fund. Um, I'm not going to bore you with COVID-19, but one has to know that COVID-19 was very unique in terms of impact on organizations. When you look through the other recess or, or recessions that we've had, you would realize that organizations did not have, were not probably, might not have probably been prepared on their balance sheet. But during COVID-19, we had just come out of the global crunch and businesses were in their top most position. Um, within, the commercial, within the commercial real estate sector, one of the areas that was greatly affected was hospitality, entertainment, retail, industrial, corporate residential, and some office markets were more resilient than the others. So I'm going to speak to this presentation with this background, with this Deloitte diagram. And it says that for every crisis, there's basically three time frames where you respond by basically um, um, dealing with the present situation and managing business and managing business continuity, recover where companies learn and employ strategies to emerge stronger and thrive where companies prepare for and shape the new normal. So I want this diagram to be at the back of your mind while we go through my slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so prior COVID, SUTA, which was one of the developments by Momentum Africa Real Estate Fund and managed by ERIS, um, had everything basically in place. So this was our main reception. Next slide, please. 
Basically, we had spacious terrace for corporate breakout sessions. And we had a coffee shop. So SU Tower is located al just around the bridge runabout. Next slide. We had access control. So the importance of this slide is the essence of smart um, building management systems, where basically um, tenants did not have to touch anything. Basically, come in, you swipe your card, and you go inside the building. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. We had spacious lobbies. Properly designed offices. We had spacious car parking accommodating 430. My CEO always says we should post about this because it's the only commercial building in Accra that basically has adequate parking. Next slide, please. We have an access control car parking. Basically, swipe again. So, in responding, so I'm just going to use Eris Ghana as a case study on how we responded and how we basically, um, what's it called, um, 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 recovered and then thrived. Um, so in responding to COVID-19, we had to first of all be compliant to government directive. The government directive was in March was for a lockdown, a complete lockdown. And so we had to immediately lock down all our properties. Now when the president came and reopened the economy, we had to look at ways that we could re-strategize and move our business forward. And in responding to COVID-19, what the first thing that we did as a landlord was we understood the liquidity challenges that businesses almost immediately had from COVID-19. And so we had to re-engage our tenant. As a very sensitive landlord, we had to look at payment structures that we could agree with tenants um, for, for them to be able to pay and not, and not, and not um, defect on payment. We put in all the COVID-19 protocols where basically you come into our building and then you don't have to touch anything, you wash your hands and move in. The essence of this presentation is to highlight um, digitalization, which in our real estate business would be the smart building management systems. So basically smart building management system is incorporating technology and the traditional facility management or building management um, ways of doing things. Where, for example, you have an access and security control boardroom, you have um, a digital way of operating all the chillers, which we know as air conditioners in the entire building. Next slide, please. So basically putting an automated COVID-19 protocol system. And again, emphasize the smart building management system where immediately the bullets there um, um, senses a human being, it would automatically open up for, for you to walk through. Next slide, please. And then what we also did in, re, in, in, in responding was to basically put motion sensor taps and dispensers in all our bathrooms, just to give people or employees the comfort not to touch anything when they visit the, the washrooms. What we also did was to make sure that we were socially distancing within our elevators, just to give, again, our tenants and employees working in the building comfort. Um, there was regular disinfection of reception and lift lobbies where we were doing it within every hour for, um, for these guys to come and disinfect the place. Just again, to emphasize that the place was, was, was COVID-19 free or was tenants were able to comfortably come into the building and work. Next slide. There was very thorough attention to details. So basically making sure that all the elevator buttons is properly cleaned. Our recovery plan. So we know in the beginning of 2021, a lot of people had come to buy into the era of working from home. But again, by the nature of some businesses, some organizations, you would, you would have to go back to work. And so the most important critical things um, in re-strategizing your return to work strategy, strategies was density reduction, sanitation and employee support measures. Um, and on density reduction, that's where my company comes in, where we have very large um, floor plates where you can basically reconfigure your space and allow for um, social distancing. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, okay. so this is SU Tower. We still have space to go. Um, and so you can come to our booth just in the corridor when we are done with this 
with this presentation. The last point that I want to dwell on is government reset. So as a real estate fund, we want to employ government to basically look at REITs. We know that it's a pipeline work, but it's something that we really want to, we really want to get it going because this is the time where we, we reset in the economy. It's the time where we would be able to attract real estate funds such as MARIF. And again, Ares as a property development firm looks at um, strategies to helping public organizations to rent to own. So it's important that both public um, organizations also feel free to approach us where we as a fund would look at acquiring a building on your behalf and giving you very flexible payment structure to be able to own in a long term. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Eris Properties, for showcasing such excellence from recovery to resilience. Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was said that a digitally aligned government must reflect in a digitally aligned society. The words of Mr. Kofi Adumako, which brings us to the keynote address to be delivered by the CEO of the Margins Gap Leading Entity Company, spearheading digitization to secure access and more. Would you please make welcome Mr. Moses Baden Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not wonderful to be back once again in human form instead of remotely in a meeting like that. Last year we missed the CEO and I thank NSAG, the founder and convener of the CEO Summit for inviting me to give a keynote address at this 2021 fifth CEO Summit, share my thoughts on the power of digital identities in resetting Ghana's economy. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Honorable Ministers, members of the Diplomatic Corps, fellow Chief Executives, Captains of Industry. In 2017, I had the privilege of delivering a keynote address on the fourth Industrial Revolution and its relevance to moving our economy forward. And that dialogue focused on the opportunities that were presented to leapfrog Ghana into a new digital, social, economic, and political future. And I made six key points that I'd like to reiterate again in concluding that keynote address. I said in 2017 that digitally constrained economies are deficient largely because they have yet to establish a digital ecosystem that can capitalize on the benefits of digitization. I also said at this point too that we must take advantage of our demographic dividend with our youthful population to train our youth with new digital skills that will enrich them to enter the modern digital economy and enable, enable them to scale globally. I called for the rethink of our educational system and the optimization of our curriculum so that it would be more pragmatic and suitable for this digital age. The fourth point I made was that our businesses must digitize and be data-driven to allow us to compete and strive for excellence globally globally, with, the deep, with new digital systems, processes, and tools that are now available to all of us to scale globally. I also called for the building of a meritocratic and values-based environment that promotes a pursuit of efficiency and productivity, an environment that will create and grow digital entrepreneurs who will build a digital infrastructure that will expand our companies and our country's economy. I call for the government to become a digital market maker and to create the best environment within which Ghana 
will become a destination of choice for businesses globally, both physically and digitally. I also call for a successful transformation of our economy through the changes of policies and laws which are realigned to be relevant to the digital age. Key elements of these policy and legal reviews were to be the protection of intellectual property, the respect, commitment, and enforcement of contractual rights that are crucial to the growth of a modern digital economy. I identified also 14 essential features of the digital age that underpin the fourth industrial revolution and digital transformation agenda, and that will rapidly, rapidly accelerated the digital speed of our economy. Now, one of the key elements of those 14 features was a call for a national electronic, digital, and biometric identification system. And so based on those key 14 features, let me now direct my attention to the immediate topic of a digital electronic identity and its impact on the national economy of Ghana post-COVID-19. COVID-19 has demonstrated to us everything that we talked about in 2017. It's accelerated the realization of companies, and individuals, and our country on the importance of digitization and the need for being able to do business through digital channels more efficiently and to transact business contactlessly. For us at the Badgers Group, we have been already prepared four years prior to that in resetting ourselves in the new digital um, platform to ensure that when COVID struck, not only did we not see any drop in efficiency of or, um, business activity, but we actually thrived better as most of our members were able to work remotely using digital platforms and collaboration in documents and uh, computers in the cloud and conducting business with various video conferencing tools and platforms. Despite that, most of our partners, both local and international, were not ready because they had not adopted the digital systems that we kept advising them on. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most significant global disruption of our time and has completely transformed the way in which we live and interact with one another. Digital adoption has taken a quantum leap at both organizational in these industry levels, and customer needs now demand offerings that reflect new health and hygiene sensitivities. Cashless transactions, remote working practices, and virtual classrooms to educate our children are now part of the new normal. People prefer contactless transactions that are given their patronage to companies who have invested in digital tools that are able to facilitate these transactions. Companies are no longer competing locally, but on a global scale. In 2020 alone, the mobile money interoperability platform in Ghana recorded, all, recorded almost up to 100 billion in contactless, in contactless payments, contactless mobile payments, which is a 5.536.2 percent increase from the year before. Now, now what's, why is such a quantum loop? Leap? Well, of course, it's because of COVID-19. I'd like to congratulate our Vice President for the Initiative for Interoperability in Payments, which made this possible. So when COVID arrived, we were ready with mobile and contactless payments. That is what I mean by saying that government must become a digital market maker for the private sector. The Bank of Ghana recently has been issuing PHP license for digital wallets to support an increasingly massive increase in digital transactions. The entire supply chain has been disrupted. disrupted. Items can be ordered online and delivered straight to your doorsteps right here in Accra, from Wachi to Catfish. There is no longer a pressing need to travel to obtain items you want. That is probably very expensive for husbands because of late, my wife has taken to shopping on exclusively on Instagram, which means money goes out of my wallet faster. The impact on service delivery business 
have been forced to innovate to stay afloat, resulting in efficient delivery services. Notably, just a few weeks ago, Tesla announced that it was accepted Bitcoin, which means, Mr. Governor, the digital currency area is upon us. Although, just days ago, they rescinded that decision because of the carbon footprint associated with massive energy consumption by supercomputers used to mine coins by crypto mining businesses. But that does not change the fact that the digital currency is approaching. Even funerals have been transformed and are taking place live on live streaming platforms. And donations are being received quite efficiently digitally and food delivered in packs. The world has indeed changed. And technology has taken center stage. Today, digital identities are more important than they ever have been before. We're a community of people that now need to be verified on multiple flat platforms guarded by physical and logical access control systems. Let's take around a look around this room. Our faces are still covered in masks. If you don't understand, the US says after our second job, we probably can't do without masks. We hope that time comes. But if you are wearing a mask, who are you really? Can you be who you claim you are? Or is an imposter pretending to be you? In the digital world, even scarier, identities are stolen daily and billions of dollars are lost as a result of identity fraud. To be safe, we must rely on our electronic digital avatars to safely connect us through secure devices to product services and solutions in order to ensure that the digital infrastructure that we build does not crumble because of crime and illegal transaction done on our behalf by max men, not your fiscal max man, but your digital masked avatar. Our communities have been challenged to think differently and innovate in order to survive the health and economic sources of this pandemic. Policymakers and citizens must adopt a multi-sectoral approach to harness innovation and emergency technologies, both locally and globally. This means regulation needs to catch up, as it unfortunately continues to lag behind the ingenuity of the digital space, its dynamism and its speed. So, if digital identities are important and we need to protect them, Question is, let me attempt to define what an electronic digital identity is and break it down in layman's terms before I go into the rather technical industry description of it. In layman's terms, a digital identity is what enables people to verify on a platform, on computers, on portals, and on the internet that you are who you claim you are, and there's a certain digital history behind you that confirms transactions that you do. So your username, your passwords, your PlayStation behavior, and other information on you, the date of birth, and your unique numbers like a social security number, your online is all form part of your digital identity. But that's in the, in the broad sense. However, a digital identity, in a technical sense, is a simple, unique primary identifier for people, normally from cradle to grave, in the case of individuals, which is an essential foundation for identification. In the USA, it is a social security number. In Denmark, it is a CPR number. In the UK, it's a national health insurance number. In Ghana, it's the Ghana card pin that identifies each person in the national identity re register and ensures that they exist only once in the database. Now, that's the first step. The number is then attached to data fields on the registration form that contains all the identity data fields collected by both public and private organizations. In the case of the National ID Register, Ghana's Register, citizens are required to go through an interview, establish a legal identity, provide the proper um, birth certificate or passport, which is then verified through an interview, and then after that, their biometrics are taken and attached to that unique number and that database. And, and the data fields that are collected by all identity collecting institutions. In addition, a digital address is added to, to that data set. And then the data is sent in real time 
to an automatic biometric identification system that looks through the database in a matter of seconds, approximately three seconds, and returns the data that shows that you're not, you don't exist twice in the database. The information is then personalized to the Ghana card. A digital certificate, which is an end user PKI, is then put in it. And this card has three interfaces. One is an ICAO passport, which is for sanctions for travel in West Africa, and hopefully with sanctions to travel globally. The other profile is an EID profile that meets international standards. It's open and it's interoperable to all digital platforms who have the right interfaces. So it means, as a Ghanaian, you can authenticate your identity anywhere in the world, provided they inter inter you're inter interacting with a, a portal that is, has a standard security interfaces, whether online or in person. The card also has another profile, which is a match on card profile that can, can compare your live biometrics with the biometrics stored in your card in real, in, real, in real time and confirm that you are who you are. It also allows the um, SPKI certificates authorized by the country certificate authority of NICHA and then also digitally signed by a sub-certificate authority of the National Identification Authority. This card can carry public and private keys and certificates that allows you to interact digitally, remotely, and in person across multiple complex platforms, digital platforms. So that's the Ghana card for you. With the national ID having, uh, having crossed the 50 million mark, that means the 50 million people plus have a digital avatar on themselves, an electronic ID that's secure to international standards to be able to carry out digital transactions, both private and public. In this regard, I must applaud the government, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for evolving and implementing an electronic and biometric identity system, which was the first put on tender in 2003. First put on tender in 2003. And now between 2019 and 2020, the National ID Authority, which is our public partner, registered over 15 million Ghanaians just in one year. Well, we hadn't been able to do that for over 20 years. Now, over 50 million people were also successfully issued electronic identity cards during the mass registration exercise. What is the effect of all this? An electronic national identity register will transform our economy and exponentially increase its digital index and grow our GDP. Citizens can access government services electronically and securely and make payments based on a certified legal identity that is robust, secure, and prevents fraud and financial crime. Compliance will be without a human interface and will have the real time, date, time, and location stamp with any identity transaction by a number that is generated by NID NIA and confirmed to the persons who they claim they are. The Vice President, I can see that the mobile payments will double in volume if they can be made more secure, which means the current issues that we have with people impersonating and, and, and you know, perpetuating fraud on people in the mobile money ecosystem will be completely eliminated because people will be who they claim they are. We can overcome the frustration of human interfaces which creates inefficiency and breeds corruption in the access of government services. The robust and secure Ghana card electronic identity will prevent fraud, which is perpetrated by stolen identities, fake identities, and multiple identities created to facilitate crime. A clean national identity register will create a clean digital ecosystem and a transparent government and e-commerce digital environment that will Help us fix the country. The government has started implementing policies to deepen the digitization of all government services. And the Vice President of the Republic, which is nicknamed the, the Digital Doctor, has recently announced new policy initiatives that are in the right direction. Key amongst these policies are the Ghana card pin to replace tax so that everybody can pay their equitable share of tax. And, and some people will be less burdened, overburdened. The Ghana pin to replace that has also recently been announced, ensuring that our social security transactions will now be connected to identity 
and fraud and uh, delivery of pensions will be faster and more efficient. The Ghana card pin to replace national health insurance, which will take the fraud out of national insurance, health insurance providers, et cetera, ensure that people are getting the right medicines and they are who they claim they are. The government payroll recently was announced by the Vice President, I think a few weeks ago, to be validated with the Ghana pins, which means that all those who own ghosts in government institutions <laughs> will be disappointed, but that will save the country a lot of money. The banking KYC transactions and um, bank transactions to be validated with Ghana card and PIN will ensure that we're not never blacklisted again and that money laundering will not be entertained in our environment and the transactions will be validated with real people behind it. SIM re-registration to be conducted with a Ghana card will also ensure that we clean our telecom industry system, uh, SIM box fraud and terrorism and criminal activity will be a thing of the past. Our Minister of Communication and Digitization has given a deadline for the start of SIM registration using the Ghana card and is ready to rule out the issuance of public key infrastructure certificates that will give our electronic devices, applications, websites, etc., a digital identity certificate that is connected to our Ghana card. This will allow citizens to facilitate electronic transactions safely on the internet whilst weeding out the 419 and Sakawa scammers. Hopefully, this will result in Ghana being whitelisted and having Ghana IP addresses with genuine certificates. This will allow our country to engage globally in the global digital market as a trusted partner. Mr. Baden, the only thing is it can't extend time and calendar. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me conclude by saying that the digital ID provides a secure digital foundation infrastructure upon which our legal identity devices, websites, and other important applications and systems can be built. Post COVID 19, our digital habits will not revert to the, to the old, old habits of analog habits. The digital ecosystem is now on steroids. If we want to succeed in this present and in the future, we need to harness its power and not be consumed by it. This CEO summit will no doubt provide invaluable insight on how our beloved country, Ghana, businesses and individual, individuals can leverage digital to be successful post COVID-19. We can fix it if we envision the future and plan for digital. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Moses Baden, a man whose boundless enthusiasm has shown through this summit right from its beginning up until now. Please, another round of applause. Thank you for those nuggets on the power of digital identities in resetting Ghana's economy. If you're joining us, we're live on Joy 99.7 and on Joy TV, it's the fifth Ghana CEO Summit and we're reflecting on digital transformation, powering business and government reset for a post-economic resilience. In a short while, we'll be hearing from our guest of honor, the Vice President of the Republic, before him, we will be hearing from the first Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana. Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is worthy of note that there are some positive cases of what post-COVID logistics in Africa looks like right here in Ghana, taking up challenges and seizing opportunities, the Meridian Port Services Digital Transformation case. Would you please make welcome the CEO, Mr. Mohamed Samara. I'm not good with heights. Okay. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here to share with you our experience with uh, digitalization and transformation of the container terminal industry in Ghana to something of a world class. And uh, I want to really, in, in person, thank His Excellency the Vice President who drove this initiative from the day that he entered into office. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the success that I will demonstrate. Basically, Madrid Import Service, just a quick background. 
Meridian Port Services is a joint venture company between Ghana Ports and Harbor Authority and two of the world's biggest container operators, AP Muller Terminal and Bolloré. MPS took a concession in 2004 to build and operate a container terminal inside the existing harbor back then, that's Tama Port. And been operating this port since 2007. Basically, the area that was given that you see, it was all warehouses and car parks, etc., was transformed in 2000, well, went into construction in 2005, into 2006, and then containers started to appear. Eventually, this was Terminal 2 that was built and started operation in 2007. When we started business in the port, the ship size was anywhere between 1,500 TEU, that's 20 foot equivalent units, to 2,000. Ships started to grow to 3,000 almost. And then MERSC launched what is known as the WAF Max, that's the West Africa maximum size vessel that can come, which is a 5,000 TEU vessel. Now, this vessel could not enter Tama Port fully laden. We had some few handicaps, the depth, the length of the ship, the height of the ship under crane, then the outreach of the crane. So we couldn't fit the port with cranes big enough to handle this ship. Also, the harbor basin could not take this vessel in, which prompted the investment in a new port infrastructure. And this port infrastructure that you see here, this is an artist impression. To the left is the new one, to the right is the old one. And this is to scale, actually. So the size is huge, and also we built it with the design criteria for 100 years. 100 years in terms of durability, also growth within the harbor basin. This arm that you see, which is called breakwater, this breakwater is actually is a pyramid with a base of 100 meters, more than a football pitch, and it's three and a half kilometer long. So Egyptians were building pyramids on land. We built it in Ghana with Ghanaians underwater. So <laughs> we took it from the beach. This is actually exactly Terminal 3. Beach site, probably beginning of 2017. And this is how it looked like. This is phase one completed. And then phase two still under construction. Phase two, also the berth here is completed. And we are currently finishing this site to make the first burst operational. Phase one was completed seven months, seven months ahead of schedule, which was a very big successful story. Phase two will be completed eight months ahead of schedule. This picture is what you see here is a 3D matrix containers being stored in a 3D matrix. And those blue gantry cranes, they move around, taking coordinates from satellite, and every box has a position using the DGPS, which is the Differential Global Positioning Systems. So containers are identified by a global positioning system on our, in our ports in Ghana, not in Europe. And we work 24-7. The old port didn't work 24-7. If you see the picture behind you, this is how we operate at night. Accra lights are in the background like a Christmas tree, you know, and we are operating in almost broad daylight in this terminal. Now, what did that, what did that make that happen? Certainly. The, digital, the digitalization and the transformation of the manual operation into kind of seamless, paperless digital flow.
I remember in your visit, Your Excellency, you insisted on everything. And we took notes of those listed items. And we have back then had our operating system, Navis, which we upgraded. But we added a gate operating system. We, operated, we added also a track appointment system. Your Excellency, when you visited, the digital penetration into MPS was 3%. Today is 90%, Your Excellency. <laughs> Thanks to all of these systems. We have the, biomet the track appointment system and biometric control. Every driver that drives a truck into Tama is already pre-registered with his the biometrics. Every truck is registered with his number as well as an RFID, radio frequency identification on his screen. License plate, recognition, and we have optical character OCR recognition that read container numbers. We have way bridges. Every driveway has a way bridge. And we have the most sophisticated scanners in this world. Basically, this is the ecosystem that we created with the stakeholders. And everything exchanged data digitally. So this has a lot of benefits, you know, and added value to the security of the data, the speed of the transaction, and the accuracy of everything. Safeguarding the state, border security, as well as the revenue earned at that point. I mean, I don't wanna, I'm told, you know, we have to go move, move fast, but we will share this with the audience. But basically, it starts with the shipping line updating the ICOMS system with the manifest data. And for us as a terminal, they share with us in a BAPLI format the position of the container on board his ship. Every ship has a 3D model with us, and basically we know which box to discharge and which box stowed where for us on board that ship before the ship arrives. And then from there, the clearing agents start interacting with ACOMS, and then it goes through the customs process, et cetera, et cetera. All that is a digital process. To summarize, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the unmanned gate system, basically, all truck drivers, they are pre-registered. Whether he's coming to imp drop import or, or uh, sorry, to pick import or drop export, he has to go through the booking system. Comes in, maybe this one speaks it better than the next one. Basically, as soon as he approaches the portal at the gate, his finger reads him. If he's a known person to come for an an appointment, he's cleared in. Then basically, his car also is red, RFID, license plate recognition. Then he moves to scanner. He's scanned. The scanning in real time, the OCR, the optical character recognition, read the container number. Within seconds, it queries the customs database, ACOM says, I've got container number one, two, three. It says empty or it says it has a car. You know, scanner takes an image of it, it's empty, matches. Or if it's declared as a car, they will see a car. If it says empty and they find something, then basically they block it. From scanner, it goes to the OCR portal. This takes a high definition picture of the truck as well as the container top, sides, and the back. And reads the container number and tells the driver at the next gate, where to go within the yard to pick or drop his container. And we have a sophisticated, massive gate complex to the entry of the terminal. Seizing opportunities. This is based on some data gathered to show where is our major import markets. And obviously, China has got the darkest color, India, 
South Africa, Turkey, that's in Europe, America, and Canada, obviously, due to a lot of Ghanaian expatriates living over there. Our export markets, again, India is taking the cashews, the timber, etc., etc. China as well taking some raw material, US, Europe taking the cocoa and the agro product. Then comes after. You know, we really never traded within our region, and this is the opportunity for the future. Some people were telling me, but uh, ECOWAS was there, didn't work. Yes, ECOWAS was there, it didn't work. But did we have internet when ECOWAS was launched? Did we have any digital penetration to trade? Can we, today on my phone, I can figure out where I can buy within a radius of a mile, two or 10,000, any product that I want. So things changed. What does it mean to us? after. Today we're creating the connectivity. It is important to have that connectivity to this market. The market is huge, as you can see in the map. We have included here only the countries that we can imagine which are reachable. And this is quite a huge area. This block that you saw on the map represents a population I mean, Nigeria alone is 200, you know. Represent a population just under half a billion. Just think about it. If each one wants to buy a pair of socks a year, that's half a billion pairs of socks. Multiply that with every consumer item that you can think of. The market is huge. And we really need to give it the focus that it deserves. Most of you represent industry. We built a port with a capacity that can take you for 100 years. So you can build also on your own capacity to serve this market, whether you're manufacturing a car or a plastic chair, and whatever in between, the market is huge. On that note, I'm finishing. The GDP, as you can see, it's all up, up, up. And also, we are in a GDP in the range of, I don't know, 800 million heading towards a trillion. This is a lot of money, guys, to be grabbed, manufactured in Ghana, and even 10% of that, if we capture, is a huge issue. GDP per capita, you know, Nigeria might be the biggest economy, you know, and et cetera, we're next to it. We're the second largest economy for sure. But we are almost per capita, same as Nigeria. So we have even the potential to have a good market over, self, uh, over here for our industry. Few examples. This is PTP terminal, which was a fishing harbor a few years back. Look at it now. Morocco, Tangier, was built right in front of Al Jazeera in Africa. It's thriving terminal. Industry is building up in Morocco. Salala and Oman, the bottom desert side of Oman, thriving terminal. We are in the center of this world, Your Excellency. I'm pleased to tell you that today, MPS Tamaport is not only doing transshipment, to Cotonou, Lagos, and Abidjan, and the interland countries. We're doing transshipment from China to Brazil, coming through Tema. The direct service, the big ships that we enabled by Terminal 3, is bringing cargo instead of sending it through the Pacific Ocean, through Panama Canal, pay high premiums to Brazil, they're bringing it on the regular service that calls Tama and the cross-Atlantic service pick from here and send it over there. Your Excellency, we're a hub between China and the Americas. We are a hub at the moment between South Africa and Europe. And thanks for the digitalization. We've got to unlock Africa.